Well, we're going to get organized here on stage. Uh, and while we do that, a question for you out there in the audience. What worries you most, artificial intelligence or climate change? The boom in AI has taken many by surprise, and there's no shortage of warnings out there about the harm that it could do to society, to humans, and to life as we know it. But you might ask what life will be like if climate change has its way. If temperatures are rising, they cause a catastrophic shift in our climate. They cause floods, droughts, fires or famines. So we have a stellar lineup of guests to talk us through some of those issues and maybe make the case for both sides. But before we welcome them, we want to hear from you. So let's ask, let's take a very unscientific poll of those in the audience, right? Phones down, everybody. Uh, which worries you most? Artificial intelligence. Hands up. All right. Okay, hands down. Now, who, for whom does climate change worry more? Oh, wow. Okay, all right. Any decisive. Any uh, undecideds out there? Oh, one on two, <laughs> two, three. <laughs> all right, a few people that we, we can convince there. So we're going to, we're going to, get your verdict later. Yes, we will try and explore some of the issues over the next 40 minutes or so. And we're going to ask you this question again at the end of this session to see whether the panel have been enough to change your minds or whether you are still undecided. Uh, so please welcome our panel. Yes, we're going to have, first of all, um, Near, near the podium here, let's get onto the stage. Bim Afalani, the a Conservative Member of Parliament. Come on down. Satin Dugal, Chief Wizard at Builder AI, and Priya Guha, Venture Partner at Marion Ventures. Nice to see you. Hey, hey Priya. Yep, Satin. Also joining us on the panel, please welcome Rachel Everard, who's Head of Sustainability at Rolls-Royce, Himanshu Gupta, Co-Founder and Chief Executive at Climate AI, and Mikhail Nakmani, Founder and Chief Executive of the Climate Policy Radar. Welcome to you. Right, all right. So Edie and I have these rather threatening <laughs> higher stools at uh, either exactly. end, but there is so much for us to get through, so nice to see you. Welcome. Um, thank you. Um, there is plenty to discuss, and I don't know necessarily whether we will have for and against because it is such a complicated issue. And as we will discuss, climate change and AI are potentially intrinsically linked. Edie, over to you. Right. Okay. Well, I tell you what, let's, let's get our questions to our our panel of experts here, straight off. Priya, we'll start with you. Starting with artificial intelligence, the warnings are stark. The godfather of AI, Jeffrey Hinton, uh, quit his job at Google, warning of the risks of what he had created. And an open letter was sent back in March from leaders in the tech space, warning that all new developments should be paused, saying we needed to take a step back. And these weren't refuseniks, not Luddites, right? So were they right? So I think what we've seen throughout history, and another sort of godfather of the world of technology, Mark Andreessen, talked about this in his recent article, is when you see a big leap in technological development, as we have recently with artificial intelligence, you do have a sudden sense of sort of moral panic, uh, both from those who've been involved in the design of that technology, so some of the names you mentioned, but also in the case of this technology, a mass recognition that something's changed and actually, um, if I may use the word, a slight hysteria about the impact of, of that technology. So I think this is no different, really. And I'm afraid, you know, I, I sit very much with um, the, the sort of populist view, as we might call it from the poll you just took earlier, Ely, <laughs> which is that actually, you know, this really is an opportunity for us not a threat, mm. and the biggest threat placing mankind in today's world is indeed climate change. Okay. So, Sashin, what are the risks? Because they are well documented. Some would suggest it's going to ruin society, take our jobs, exacerbate inequality. Are any of those true, do you think? You know, um, I, uh, I find this, this topic really interesting mm. um, because I think there's only a handful of experts in the world, but hundreds of thousands of people with an opinion. Yep. <laughs> um, you have to ask yourself what changed in 90 days or 180 days. We didn't build LLMs. LLMs started with BERT, which was almost a decade ago. What changed was 
kind of looks like your mom because it's on WhatsApp, <laughs> sort of types like your wife because it's echoing local characters. It's intentionally been slowed down so that it feels human-like. Mm -hmm. And then we got mass hysteria of everybody thinking jobs are going. But you know, if we, if we look at parallels, we're in the AOL of the internet days. And I give you like some simple things. If I ask anyone in this room what, you know, I call this the, the turmeric analogy. If I ask everyone in this room what you use turmeric for, people would have a very precise answer. But you have these algorithms that are being built on the West Coast that are being tagged with data from, from labelers in the Philippines. And so someone in California goes to it and says, what do you use turmeric for? I use it for my latte. Okay, now someone from Bangalore goes, what do you use turmeric for? I use it for curry. Someone from Ho Chi Minh goes and says, what do you use turmeric for? I use it for a wound. Mm -hmm. and, and so we haven't even started to get to the point of how would you explain colonization to a child growing up in North London versus a child growing up in, in, um, in Mumbai? Or how would we explain American independence to a kid growing up in New York versus a kid growing up in London? And, and I think this is why the hysteria of Teachers are going to go, doctors are going to go, everything is going to go, and it's just going to be a connected machine. Mm. We're really far away. Um, and, and so then you have to ask yourself, why is regulation so important now if we're so far away? It's like, well, we kind of screwed up the first two. This is the trifecta. We, we messed up regulating cloud. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's only three powerhouses. They're all American companies. We missed regulating social media. There's only three powerhouses. They're all American companies. Just sort of getting the trend here, right? Um, we we're about we all we hopefully have not misregulating AI, but you know, three CEOs went to number ten. They're all American companies, um, and we have this unique opportunity now to really think about this properly. And and, and I leave you with one thing. And, and sorry, I'm sounding very philosophical, but the last time mankind had this kind of um, opportunity was in the period of Da Vinci, yeah. right? Because so you had a guy that was an artist. He was an architect. He was a philosopher. He wrote backwards so that he couldn't get hung for his ideas. If you think about how we're going to solve the problem we're in today, whether it's climate or AI, uh, more on the AI side, um, it's a multi-party, multi-person, multi-discipline problem that goes right the way through arts, philosophy, mathematics, and engineering. And regulation. And how we've regulated everything else has failed. Yeah. It's called a spade a spade. And this time around, we have to take a fresh approach to how to do it. And I want to come on to that thought in just a second, actually, about regulation and, and crucially, I guess, how quickly we need to do that. But that's a, a separate thought, isn't it? Yeah, well, I tell you what, Bim, let's, let's talk about how you balance regulation without stifling innovation and take on that point about how do we stop what happened in the last two iterations, stop what happened with the web, stop what happened with social media from happening yet again with artificial intelligence, with having it be three companies from, let's face it, my hometown in, uh, in California <laughs> from ruling all the land. So the first thing to say is that um, I just thought that what Sachin you just said was incredibly perceptive and powerful. I would, however, in, and to, to connect this to climate change, because I know, and I, think, and I think we can connect these two, for everybody in this room who thinks that climate change is, is a much greater threat to humankind than AI, and I understand the reasons why, I think they should be thinking, well, if we have faith that human beings can create something like artificial intelligence, for largely positive ends, nobody's saying 100%, but for largely positive ends, with the huge amounts of human ingenuity that that requires, we should also have faith that when it comes to that level of ingenuity, thinking about climate challenges, we can solve them. So I think that that is something that we should all bear in mind. In relation to your precise point around regulation and innovation, I'm not sure, and I say this very gently to somebody with your expertise, I am not sure that you've posed the right question in particular. It is unfortunate if you're from any other country than the United States. Obviously, we'd love to have those three companies in the UK and India, I'm sure, would love to have those three companies. But the most important thing is the output. The most fundamentally important thing is economically and societally, what is the output that this technology generates? And there is a 
with artificial intelligence, because of the nature of how the large language models work, by all means, the big beer moths in the first iteration may be American, but the quality of that technology can improve things for everybody across society everywhere. And it is of secondary concern in regulatory terms exactly whether you end up with two or three or ten or where they are from. Because the most important thing with regulation is the human impact, it's the economic impact, it's a societal impact. They're the most important things when it comes to innovation and regulation. I can see a few people want to come back on that briefly. Do either of you want to just come back yeah, on that? Um, I will if, I don't, if you don't mind. I mean, I think um, the challenge of regulation, and you will know this very much from you know, sitting in Parliament and going through the regulation in some depth, is the unintended consequences. Of course. And so you're, you're absolutely right that we need to focus on impact of the technologies. And, in, and indeed, you know, if we, we look at Sir Keir Starmer's remarks earlier, you know, it very much parallels that approach that you've rightly outlined there in terms of thinking of the impact and how we regulate for that. I guess the, the example that Sachin rightly brought to mind was that when we have tried to regulate in that way historically, we have essentially crowded out the market mm for new players. So I think one of the opportunities of the regulatory framework will create for AI is actually, how do you create that in a way that focuses rightly on the impact, but makes sure that new players can come through and we're not stifling innovation in effect by constraining the market just to the big players who already have a seat at the table. Yeah, and I think to add to Priya's point, so I'm, I'm gonna disagree quite vigorously to, to, to some of what you said. I don't think it's about going to American CEOs because they're well-funded, when you actually unpack it, it's British engineers that are actually working in the UK mm. that are doing the work. And so now you have an absolute disconnect between those peddling a foreign agenda and those doing the work and then the experts. I'd also caveat this by saying that I think this is a multimodal problem. So you need people from philosophy, from arts, and you need people that have a slightly more neutered view of the world my, my worry is, like, remember, this is the, th the third trifecta. There's nothing after this. We tried the same thing in the cloud, and we're subservient. We tried the same thing in social media. We can't control it, no matter what we try. And you know, to do the same thing three times, you know, clinical definition of insanity, <laughs> expecting a different result. Rachel. Um there's an interesting debate that opens up here, isn't it? And, and around AI, we feel that perhaps we're at a point where we can shape regulation. We're at the start of this journey, um, and we can have a view on how it should develop and, and what the framework will be. Perhaps the reason we saw so many hands up for the fear of climate change is that we feel that that ship has sailed, that there is something coming down the line to us mm -hmm. that we have very little power to stop right now. You're ahead of sustainability. Is that true? Can we do anything about climate change? <laughs> That's a big question, but I mean, I certainly hope not. I think what we've seen, and, and you quoted the letter from, I think, three months ago. Um, it was over a year ago that the UN Secretary General said that we are on track to an unlivable planet. So we've seen that threat time and time again in terms of climate. We haven't really fully responded to that with the global potential and pace that we need to. What I think is really exciting about artificial intelligence is you actually have a lot of the commonalities in terms of huge amounts of data, and engage communities. And thinking about how that could be applied to the climate crisis, great potential. So how regulation can make sure that we are able to utilize AI for good, that's where there's huge potential for all of us, I think, to think about a sustainable transition to a low carbon economy. And to our point, that's about getting ahead of the curve, isn't it, where we can still shape that regulation and make sure that it's not about banning it, stopping it, or not embracing it. Embrace it, but make sure it's done for the right reason. Exactly. And one of the things that Rolls-Royce has developed is something we call the Aletheia framework. So it's a framework for the ethical application of AI that talks about both when you should be using AI, but then when you've made that decision, how you can use it in a way that considers this wider sustainability impacts. That's something we apply across our company to think about both the what and the how, and make sure that we're considering the ethical, the environmental and the social aspects of artificial intelligence in a way that enables us to make more sustainable decisions. Nicole, do you want to come in on this? I can see you taking oh. some deep intakes of breath. <laughs> I am, because uh, it's been 11 minutes and we haven't talked about climate change yet. Right, your turn. And climate change is a thing and AI is a technology. India experienced 314 days out of 365 in 2022. In each one of those days, there was an extreme weather event in some part of the country. 
Those are heat waves that people cannot go outside to work. Those are fields and crops that are dying and unable to produce food. These are people dying from heat waves, from floods. These are internal migration and external migration refugee crises. And these are the real things that are happening. Now, technology is neutral. It can be used for good, it could be used for bad, but it is a means to apply to a problem. AI is not the problem. AI is a means that can be applied. How do we apply it usefully and meaningfully is a question. Now, regulation and innovation also go hand in hand, and we need data for both. We need to understand where there are opportunities, where are there are investment opportunities, where are things going that if there is regulation coming, then you know that the supply chain is already dying and you might want to um, um, arrange yourself accordingly and plan for the transition. And when we think about what AI can do for climate change, we can think about a whole range of opportunities. We can think about, for example, cloud forecasting in a way that allows us to optimize solar on, uh, onboarding to the grid. We can say, we are now able to shut down coal plants and take care of the workers, of course, on the side. That is a secondary problem here. Not of, not of importance, but of second nature to, to this issue. So we can check when are the clouds over the, over the solar plants, over the solar um, panels, so we can make sure that we can do that and the prices will drop and the air pollution will drop and mortality related from air pollution will drop. We can read hundreds and thousands of documents really, really fast and translate them automatically from every language so we can break down knowledge silos and be able to innovate faster, to learn faster from each other's um, successes and mistakes. We can forecast when the hurricane is coming so we can call, all, call, call our cattle in to reduce the damages. There's so many things that we can do when we are able to take big data and synthesize it fast and do it in a way that doesn't leave us in our little anecdotal silos because that's what brought us here now. And our big challenge is how to do that fast because climate change is here. It's not a thing of the future, it's not anything else. We can harness AI in order to do that. We need to do it responsibly. We need to do it in a way that takes into account the bias and the hallucinations and the fabrications and all of the, and the US monopoly, all of that is important, right. but we don't have time. So, <laughs> we don't have time. Um, Himanshu, do you agree that the threat from AI, for if there is any, is sort of 10 to 20 years down the line, or maybe, I don't know, 10 to 20 months, depending on your point of view, whereas with climate change, we've already passed the point of potentially no return? Well, first of all, like, I run a company called Climate.ai. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm basically torn <laughs> in this debate. Um, however, I think both of them are uh, big threats. Um, and, and I'll talk about climate change. And, and of course, uh, it's a more imminent threat for us. And just to build on what Mikhail said, by the time we are done with this panel discussion, there'll be 400 kids who will be pushed into acute hunger in Somalia and Sudan in just 40 minutes, right? Um, but, but having, like, having run the AI company um, out of Stanford, like we started out of Stanford University, and what worries me more about AI is not the AI in its current format. It's the ingenuity of the human mind, as you talked about, right? I remember in 2015, uh, when start, I started my uh, grad school, uh, I was uh, you know, in a canteen uh, waiting for my food, and there was uh, an undergrad who was 18 year old, uh, in computer science at Stanford University, and I was, we were just chatting together, and I asked him, so what are you working on? Uh, that was in 2015, and he said, yeah, you know what, I'm trying to create, uh, uh, you know, work on some generative technologies that will allow you to mimic, allow me to mimic your voice, right? And that to me, that time the concept seemed so foreign to me. Mm. Like, how is that possible? I'm talking 2014 and 15, where people, people were just talking about like machine learning models, not even deep learning models back then. Mm -hmm. um, one and a half years from then, same kid, a 19 year old, comes up with like a completely fake video of a president of Stanford University giving a speech, right? So that's the ingenuity <laughs> of human mind that worries me. You know, in, in the next uh, 10 years and 20 years, what might happen, um, however, there's absolutely, absolutely no doubt uh, as to climate change is a, bigger, is a bigger threat right now. And one of the reasons 
we are actually having this debate is IPCC, like for all the hard work they have done, they have not done a great job uh, in communicating the, the, the existential threat of climate change. You know, we talk about like, hey, you know what, by 2050, the world uh, global average temperature is going to rise by two degrees, three degrees, four degrees. But back then, everyone is like, okay, how does it matter? Yeah. Four degrees global warming average, how does it matter, right? Uh, versus like, we conducted, so through our platform, we conducted uh, the tipping point uh, analysis for maize uh, crops in whole of Africa, mm. right? By tipping point, what, what I mean by tipping point is not the, you know, the glaciers melting or, uh, or uh, the Arctic circulation like uh, stopping. We are talking about tipping, tipping points in food system. Uh, and what we realize is that, um, so what we were trying to analyze is when is it that the crop, you know, the, the maize or the corn as we call in the US uh, will cross uh, a new normal where historically, if you had seen uh, losses like once in 10 years, you'll start seeing losses uh, four or five times out of 10, or like basically every alternate year. And what we saw is basically surprised us that almost 70% of African counties have crossed that tipping point mm -hmm. already. And by 2033 or 2034, whole of Africa would have crossed that tipping point, mm -hmm. right? So to, to, to her point, I think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a more imminent threat uh, than we realize. Sachin, I want to bring you in actually, because isn't there a danger here that we're all looking at climate change through a very confused, different set of circumstances? We see different effects in different parts of the world. There is, you know, a, a country by country approach to how they will solve it. There is a reducing emissions here and China's pumping out more than ever. There's no joined up strategy because we haven't identified a sole cause and a sole solution. Can AI help us with that? You know, I think that's, that actually to me is the pertinent question, right? Which is, uh, I think if AI in the wrong hands is like nuclear power in the wrong hands, except it has the ability to create civil unrest and manipulate minds because, you know, ultimately human beings rely on four chemical reactions, dopamine, endorphins, oxytocin, and um, serotonin. Thank you very much. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> <clears throat> two of them are selfish, two of them are family oriented you can manipulate the life out of them. Like Blackberry did this really well with the red light. Um, but now you think about the reason why we don't feel climate change is because people talk about it in one or two degrees, mm -hmm. which to an expert is alarming. Yeah. But to me, it's like, well, that's just changing the thermostat in the, in, in, in the house. Um, I think the second is that it feels like there's no point of truth. Mm. So actually, since we last spoke, I. I've been having lots of conversations with ChatGPT yep. and have been saying, you know, could you help me understand climate change? Could you help me understand what contributes to climate change? And it was really interesting. When I asked ChatGPT what contributes to climate change, I always thought it was greenhouse gases. But yes, energy production is 35%, but deforestation, landfills, building and construction, land use, manufacturing technique is 70% or 65%. So, you know, we always think about gases and we forget about, well, we just use 3D printing for making buildings. And so suddenly you have now a tool at mass disposal where you can ask kind of intelligent questions. You know, can we learn anything from any other industry? So my second question was, could we learn from another industry? What are parallels? Because we're doing this in drug discovery. In drug discovery, you've got multi-disciplines that have otherwise always been separated, yeah. but are now being coming, are coming together because these models can evaluate multiple brains at once. Yeah, um, I was going to say, Andrea, that. that's the point, isn't it? It's about bringing different disciplines into the same room without that lens of sort of human failure or human interpretation. It's saying, this is the data, and then it's down to humans to decide what to do with it, as opposed to us seeing it through all of our different failings yeah. and foibles. This is about looking at pure data and then filtering out all the noise. Yeah. So um, in the same article I was referencing right at the beginning, Mark Andreessen also talks about this being about augmenting human intelligence. Mm -hmm. And if you know, anyone wants to take one thing away, I really encourage people to think about that framing for artificial intelligence, because it does exactly as you said, Ben. This is about looking, as Mikhail was saying earlier, it's about looking at the depth and diversity of this huge problem we are facing today for the generations of the future around climate change and understanding how best to navigate it. And actually artificial intelligence for me, as I think for many of the panelists here, 
is really one of the real opportunities in doing something today about this problem that needs action and has sat really unaddressed in all of the years since Paris, you know, partly because we've been distracted with the pandemic, but really there's no excuse. Yeah, Mikhail, I know you want to come in on this idea around technology and artificial intelligence and climate change. You mentioned that there's no silver bullet, thank you. There's no silver bullet for, for addressing climate change because climate change is everything. Everything is either impacted by climate change or impacts climate change. The way we move, the way we produce, the way we um, consume and produce, and all of, everything is climate change. And in that, the ability to take masses of data and not to consolidate them into this is what we're going to do, but actually to say, ooh, for you, this is the right thing, and for you, this is the right thing, and in this environment, with this cultural framing, this is the right way to talk about it so we can get it through Parliament, and in this way, this is the right way to think about it because he, we have hydrogen, we have this, we have a problem with methane, we have a problem with our kids, we have a big problem with our elders, depending on our population um, size and, and, and shape. So the ability to, to take these masses and dip into them quickly and uh, creatively, that is, that is the power here. And this is what we need to be doing. And I'm so glad I answered anti-inflammatory to your turmeric question earlier. So, <laughs> so I don't look like I'm from California. <laughs> and, Rachel, what does AI at Rolls-Royce look like? And how do you use that technology on a day-to-day -day basis? Because with respect, the aviation industry, one of the biggest polluters, the biggest sector that's polluting, it's just tinkering around the edges until we really get to grips with this problem. I and mean, here we are on the brink of that one and a half degrees that we keep talking about, and yet there is no meaningful change. What does AI look like in Rolls-Royce? Yeah, I mean, it's multifaceted, and I know that's a very simple answer, but it looks across every point of decision-making and looking at where we can create the most efficiencies and therefore the best opportunity, and that in turn leads to emissions reductions. But I think I wanted to come back actually on your point earlier about climate change feeling kind of intangible. And one particular platform that was launched at COP26 in Glasgow a few years ago was the This Is Not Our Climate platform, mm -hmm. which combined, you know, you can look up any address in the world, so your workplace, your home, your favourite coffee shop, and see what that would look like under sea level rise, under wildfire threat, right. under pollution. And I think that is the sort of use case where simple, tangible examples of what does climate change look like for me can be really interesting. Does it and really change our behaviour, though? We see it. It feels like it's gone off, excuse you know, the term, but it's gone off the boil. Like, yeah. we're not as concerned as we were, are we? I think we are as concerned. I think it's just about different, I don't know, priorities at the moment. There's so much information overload, but I think climate change is that continual con constant that we need to be more concerned about. Yeah, we're running out of time, but yeah, such I was a very say, briefly. Th th there's one thing to learn about what happened in the last 180 days with AI is that we suddenly changed the anthropology of how people engage with it, which is a chat screen which feels human-like, mm. and it became so real so quickly, and it's actually not that real yet. Mm. And then on the other hand, you've got climate change, which is really real, but all the numbers and everything are so abstract, it, it, it's just not hitting home. Mm. Very, very briefly, I'm, Bim. I know you want to come in, Bim. Just to say that when, when uh, COVID turned up and the world was faced with COVID, it was amazing how quickly a lot of people forgot about climate as being a, a big problem. And the reason for that was it was the lack of immediacy. Mm -hmm. And so I think that is the absolute key problem uh, that has to be tackled internationally as much as uh, within our country. But let's not kid ourselves, we won't face another global pandemic caused by climate change. I think that's how we bring that to life. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think we've gone over, I'm afraid. We're getting, yeah. we're getting pulled off the, the stage with a hook. There is so much more we could talk about, as you can see. This debate will continue, I'm sure. Um, we want, can we get the lights up in the room again? Um, because I want to see, and I think I probably know the answer to this already, have we changed anybody's minds? Uh, a show of hands if anyone thought that it was climate change and now worried about AI or vice versa. The few that said AI was the big risk, have you been convinced it's now climate change? One. All One right. brave man. Congratulations. <laughs> well done. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, and I think it's um, Sashin talked there about asking chat GPT stuff. I asked chat GPT exactly this question. I said, uh, what is the bigger threat? Is it climate change or AI? Here's what it said. It is possible that both could pose existential threats in future. It's difficult to say for sure, though, which is the bigger threat. Climate change is a more immediate threat, as we've discussed. AI has the potential to be even more destructive. Ultimately, the answer to this question will depend on how we choose to develop and use 
these technologies, and I think we've underlined that here today. So uh, to our panel, thank you so much. Uh, wonderful to have you with us. Thank you. Give them a huge round of applause.